Okay, so this week uh, we've got Chris Rainford with us uh, as our special guest. Now, some of you might recognise that name. Uh, Chris is one of our UAV Hub uh, flight test instructors. So some of you might have uh, met him uh, as you were coming through your journey with UAV Hub. Um, but obviously he's had uh, quite a, a colourful past with drones and other uh, bits and pieces too. So uh, before we start, we'll just say uh, hi, Chris. Thanks a lot and uh, thank you for joining us as well. Cheers, Tom. Thanks for uh, inviting me on to the equivalent of the uh, one show for drones. So, yeah, that's brilliant news. <laughs> that's it. I like that. I think we'll carry on using that description. That sounds uh, that sounds really good. Uh, brilliant. So, yeah, so like I said, you're obviously our UAV hub, uh, well, one of our UAV hub flight test instructors. Uh, but obviously, uh, things started a little bit sort of further uh, sort of uh, in the past for yourself. So basically, how did you get into uh, using drones? Obviously, you did used to work for the Lancashire Fire and Rescue Service. So just give us kind of a, an introduction or an overview of how you sort of got into all of that, if you don't mind. Yeah, so um, about 11 years ago now, I was actually working for Manchester. I did my first 30 years with the fire service with Greater Manchester and just did the last four with Lancashire. Ah, okay. um, but back in 2010, uh, part of my duties was flying on the back of the police helicopter. Um, oh. And... Some uh, bright spark upstairs uh, just said, look, these drones are coming in. Can you go and have a look at them as a, as a concept for us? Because mm. you obviously know all about them. Now, the, the, the uh, rationale was because I'd, I'd seen an incident from above. I oh. would be able to use my experience to see if drones were of any good. And at the time, I had no drone experience at all. So it was quite a steep yeah. learning curve for about uh, six months. And then yeah. I basically spent the next 10 years sort of flying drones for the fire service and the police because oh, okay. um, most of the, the counties in the, um, in the UK have a joined up team or they work very close with one another because there's mm. quite a lot of cross-pollination between the police and the fire service oh, okay. in the type of incidents they go to. So, um, yeah, um, started, you know, really small potatoes, just one or two incidents, mm. uh, but built up to sort of establishing several 24-7 teams for the police and the fire service. Oh, okay. Um, been to well over a 1,000 incidents. And that's not a thousand flights, that's a thousand times where we might have flown five or six times. So you can sort of see the volume oh, right. of flying that we used to do for the emergency services. Yeah, and that was yeah. uh, right up to the end of 2020 mm. um, when I pretty much retired and started flying commercially. Um, right. Last three years was probably the toughest because that's when we, we took on an NQE as well. Um, we were conscious of the fact that emergency services were getting a bit of a bum deal with regards to... Um, uh, ground school. You oh, know, yeah. a, lot of a lot of companies out there would just try to nail the hat on and, and charge an enormous amount of money. Yeah. Um, so we struck, I, we established uh, the sort of the first one uh, and we were able to sort of put hundreds of people through our extremely bespoke uh, ground school. Oh, so, um, so you essentially became a, a, a training company, an NQE, so you said. Yeah, I see. Uh, we did. And it, it's, it's funny you should describe it like that, Tom, because it was a business within a business. Yeah. Um, <laughs> as soon as we started doing it and we saw the work that was entailed, um, it was just huge. Mm. Now, one of the reasons when we went to convert to RAE that I think the CAA booted us out was the course was too bespoke. And at uh, first, I, I, you know, I, I argued against it. But unless you can use it for commercial, you know, and civilian people as well, um, they weren't having it at all. Oh, so, right. um, yeah. oh, so you did try. You did, did try we, to convert over. Interesting. We, yeah, we did. But when I looked at, it, I mean, you 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 know what it's like to sort of uh, establish an area and this kind of stuff. You, you know, you've got to put forward and establish, yeah. and it was horrendously difficult. <laughs> um, and it was one of those where it wasn't the world's you know hardest phone call when they rung up and say, "Yeah, I'm sorry, we can't have you." Um, mm. It was almost uh, yeah, brilliant news, and I'll go and do some commercial flying now. <laughs> Instead, yeah. yeah. Oh, so I'm, so, I'm sorry that was a bit long-winded, Tom, but yeah, that's, no, that's, that's, no, that's, that's a, a, a good introduction, no, and I think it's nice to hear kind of how you got into where you where you are and sort of uh, what you've been doing um, as well. So obviously, yeah, you were working as a, as a training company, and obviously, I think it says here that you were uh, the accountable manager as well, sort of for that side of things too, is that correct? Do you know what, mate? I was pretty much everything. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of different <laughs> feeling. Yeah, I was just going to say, Adam, yes, yeah, chief pilot, you know, no maintenance person, trainer, accountable person. Um, the, uh, yeah, I, I suppose because yeah, it's too late now. We have all sorts of names on, but it was me who was doing it all on our ops manual. So, um, yeah, which is a great learning curve, you know, for going forward, because you you understand what other people are going through, especially in the commercial world. So. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, so interesting that you kind of see or you, you were kind of there 
uh, just when drones were becoming sort of known about and you were sort of in charge of going to sort of, you know, uh, research them and understand sort of uh, what they could do for, for the business, etc. Do, do you know, um, it's, it, I, I'm, I, I hate to cut a crash at something, it's right. really unprofessional, no. but uh, <laughs> uh, I remember right at the start back in 2010, the first drone in the UK for the emergency services was Hampshire Fire Service. And they oh, okay. had pretty much uh, an eight-stroke, nine-foot helicopter with a camera underneath. That oh, stayed really? in the air for about wow. 45 seconds. Um, <laughs> needed a, you know, a low loader to bring it to the incident ground. And yeah. now when you look at where we've come in the, in the space of 10 years, um, mm. it, was just, it was just unconceivable huge, really, what, where we've, we've come from and where we are now, yeah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, so I was going to sort of say, you've obviously seen how it started. You've just mentioned that. What, what is it now? What, are, so what would you say the drone scene is now with emergency services? What drones maybe do they use? Uh, are there... Uh, sort of bespoke types of aircraft are they all just flying Mavic minis around you know what's uh, so, how does it work um it, yeah quite a, a sweeping question that Tom thanks very much That's uh, all right. the major <laughs> majority of the police and the fire service in the UK have now got a drone asset okay yeah um the police and the fire service play something called burnt fingers uh, technology where they'll let a, um, a neighboring force or brigade buy something um, burn the fingers with it, and if they don't burn the fingers, they'll buy it. So you ah, can say, you know, one or two, uh, you know, pioneers, they'll go and get, you know, whatever is uh, available at the time, then everyone will sort of pile on behind them. Oh, so at okay. the moment, there's very few counties in the UK who haven't got some kind of an emergency service drone asset. Um, hmm. What are they flying? I would say, when you look at, I know we talk about Mavic Minis and Mavics all the time because they're hmm. sort of, they look like the workhorse of the commercial world, but if you look at it, the one of the biggest stats you need for emergency service work is a thermal image camera. Right. And you also need someone that does a fair bit of wind. Some kind of, I'm not saying it needs to be sort of waterproof, but it does need to be able to take a shower just in case you get caught in one. Yeah. Um, right. So it, it's, it started off that we were flying, uh, people were flying Inspires because that was all that was out there. Inspire yeah. 1, Inspire 2. Uh, a few of us that had the money were flying area on Sky Ranger, which was a great bit of kit, uh, but was yeah. was dated when I bought it back in 2014. So God knows what it is now. I think when I did my qualification back about in 2014 with Resource, they had one of those there to, to show all the students, and it was quite impressive, and it was quite expensive, I think, as well. So, but, so uh... it was <laughs> it's, um, when we bought the first one, I think it was fifty five thousand pound. Cool. Um, yeah. and, wow. and and when we bought the last, it was it was upwards of seventy. Um, oh wow! Now, when you go to somebody and you say, "Look, you you either buy the right kit or you buy no kit," it was very much that was the case in in uh, in the old days. We didn't, yeah. we weren't sure whether the the DJI package could actually support some of the weatherproofing that um, at the time Aerion could uh, you know confirm. Yeah. Um, so we looked at it like if we're going to do it, we want to do it properly and we want to do it with the right kit. So if we buy the right kit, um, exponentially, if you buy a drone for £50,000 but you get 1,000 flights out of it, it costs a £5 per flight. Yeah. yeah if really you buy a drone for £8,000 and you can only fly it 20 times a year, then it becomes more expensive than the £50,000. Oh, so yeah, that was the yeah. way I used to sort of sell it to our chief anyway. Um, yeah, that sounds who, good. That's a good way of justifying it, isn't it? For who sure. at the time, <laughs> I'll, I'll give them the due, they had to put the neck on the um, on the chopping block, you know, for the, you know, they're accountable to the public when, you yeah. know, uh, and how they spend £50,000. And it's a <laughs> lot of money because it was almost a punt in them days. Mm. And so, um, if it but, didn't work or it crashed or something went wrong with it, so well, it's a big. And, big and I've, I've got to be honest with you, Tom. Um, for the first three months, every time my page went off and I went to a job, um, nerves, you know, heart <laughs> jumping out of my chest because they're thinking, well, if this doesn't work, it's my fault, and they'll just yeah. they'll just get rid of it. And I could see the potential of it. Mm. Um, and and once you've got. I don't know, 50, 60, 70 jobs. I don't give a monkeys if it falls out of the sky then because you can actually establish some evidence that, yeah, we'll just uh -huh. go and buy another. You know, I it's see. emerging technology. Something will happen to it at some stage, yeah. Um, you know, it's not, um, I don't want to say a transit van, but it's, it's <laughs> at some stage something will happen. Yeah. But if yeah. you've got that sort of empirical evidence behind you and you can say, well, actually, yeah, let's go and buy another and then we'll, we'll carry on with the work. Yeah. Um, so it's quite, it's quite a nervous 12 months, Tom. Yeah, I'm sure it sounds like it. Yeah, that's it. But it's yeah, it's it's interesting to hear kind of yeah what aircraft were bought and kind of obviously they did work and it did help the industry and uh, yeah it's sort of evolved from there I suppose really hasn't it. So uh, if we now just move into uh, a slightly different kind of area now I suppose. So we understand 
that obviously you use aircraft uh, and the emergency services use aircraft. Um, what are your permissions like? So do you have to work with the same rules that the general public have to work with? Or do you have potentially special exemptions? And I think Adam's so, going to take over from me after this too. But what what do you have permission wise? Can you just rock up and do what you like? So so just before I tell you about the exemptions, because there are, yes, we do carry exemptions. Or, you know, I don't want to pretend I'm still working from because I retired in 2020. But mm. it's the, the legislation is still exactly the same. But just before I tell you about the exemptions, it's, it's probably uh, quite pertinent if I tell you some of the things that we've got to sort of deal with, which is why we've got the exemptions. So uh, rather yeah, than great. sort of people say, oh, why have you got exemptions? So <laughs> as an emergency service drone um, asset or pilot, the things you can't control are time of call, location, weather, type of job you're going to. Uh, now, when I fly co commercially, I only go out on warm, sunny days, you know, with hardly <laughs> any wind. If you're on call and you get a missing person or a firearms incident or, you know, one of a plethora of incidents, you've mm. got to go out the front door. Yeah. Uh, now, unless it's teaming with rain, invariably, you've got to launch the aircraft. Um, and, and I don't mean that in a dangerous way. We still have to sort of put some kind of dynamic risk assessment together, yeah. but it's not the kind of pre-site survey you would have the benefit of doing commercially, no. you know, the day, the day before. Even when you get to a job, you've still got an hour or two where you can sort of sit down and, and say, yeah, is this viable? Yes. <laughs> you can get to a job at 3 o'clock in the morning. It's pitch black. It is blowing uh, there's all sorts of fast-moving scenarios going on. Mm. Um, and what we found for the first couple of years is we, we were breaking the law every time we took off. So right, yeah. you would fly beyond visual line of sight, and yeah. that's not just a long way. You'd probably put it behind a house and lose sight oh. of the drone for a minute. Yeah. Or yeah. you would fly it eight or 900 metres away on a missing person. Um, yeah. And we used to justify it by, well, we're saving life. If we don't put yeah. that drone there... Um, somebody, you know, might, may lose their life or, you know, be seriously injured. It, we, we used to badger the CAA early days to sort of explain to them that uh, CAP 393, CAP 722, we just couldn't keep in it. You know, no. it, was, it was impossible. So back in oh, 20, late 2016, early 2017, they said, right, we'll put some exemptions in place for you. Um, okay. But the exemptions basically mean you can forget about CAP 393 and 722, Mm. Apart from the 400 foot, we would like you to still keep the 400 foot. Albeit, okay. you can go 100 foot above the 400 foot if there's a building higher. So if, for instance, uh, you were flying over the shard, 1,000 foot, you can go to 1,100 foot. I see, yeah. above the building. But, yeah. but they were no. quite keen that we didn't just start banging at 800 foot in the air. <laughs> you know, the 400 yeah. foot was sort of the, 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 the thing you've, they kept us You've got to have a reason to, to go above. You can't yeah. just, yeah, you can't just in the middle of the field I, and go above. You've got to have I, a reason to be going. And you couldn't fly um, at 1,100 foot from a mile away. You had to sort of pretty much take it to the building, then go up the side of the building, uh, then over okay. the top of it and down the other side, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the caveat or the big thing that, you know, the CEA were really keen with uh, was that it was short-term reactive. So in as much as you would drive a police car or fire engine to uh, an incident under blue lights, if you got to a job and you wanted to sort of, and, and I mean this in inverted commas, break the law, mm. it had to be short term. You know, yeah. is there somebody's life we're going to save in the next 20 minutes? Yes, you can put the drone beyond visual line of sight. Yeah. Or you can yeah. put it closer than 50 metres or, you know, all the things that we have to sort of um, adhere to at, at present. Yeah, um, I see. Now, as this um, developed, what generally happened as we got busier and busier is we were pretty much using the exemptions every day. Yeah, And one of the stipulations from the CAA is, um, yeah, you log every time you use the exemptions, and when you come up for your renewal every year, you, you, you let us know. Oh, okay. um, now, we were getting to the stage where we were using them, I don't know, between 100 and 150 times a year. <laughs> and it doesn't become an exemption then. It almost becomes normal practice. Yeah. So just as I was leaving, the CAA was sort of discussing, well, you would be better getting an operational safety case, yeah, and then you wouldn't have to use your exemptions. Um, and it's it's quite, well, you know what it's like to put an OSC in. Um, yeah. <laughs> if people can get away with having a standard permission and just using their exemptions, they will do. Um, and yes. we did, you know, a far easier life. But I know it's now being looked at with a, a, a lot more detail to see if you need an OSC. So, yeah. Oh, so that's I interesting see, yeah. that, um, yeah, that, that, yeah, you guys, even though this exemption was in place, it's, again, inverted commas, only supposed to be used in exceptional circumstances, but I suppose by the definition of emergency services, <laughs> it, 
it's always an exceptional circumstance, generally. It, it was, mm. it was, it was framed a little bit more specifically, Adam. Um, it was, it was a save life or a major incident. Right. Now, yeah, you could be a bit woolly and say, well, I, I was going to save a life eventually, but you sort of know the difference. If, you, if you're turning up per, to, to somebody on a rooftop, yeah, um, and I don't know, the, the 30 foot above the ground, um, and you've got to fly beyond visual line of sight or something like that or too close to them, yeah, you can probably justify it, but there's some that are a little bit tenuous. Um, yeah, I see. For instance, if, if we flew a fire and it wasn't a particularly dangerous fire, well, then I don't think you could use your exemptions because nobody was going to die if we didn't get them pictures. No. And it wasn't a major incident. So um, the, tr the trouble is, is when you're making decisions quite quickly, in, in, and when I say at night, because I mm. will say 65 to 70% of our incidents were in the dark, oh. um, it's not the sort of black and white where you can actually sort of step back and think, mm, I, am I actually sort of doing this properly and remembering all the sort of steps of the sort of exemption? Uh, or should I just go and do it, get the pictures, save the life, land the drone, and, and people start singing songs about you. So, um, so I suppose it's a bit more like the old kind of, you know, I suppose, forgive, you know, it's ask for forgiveness rather than, you know, don't ask for permission, ask for forgiveness. It's a bit easier. Yeah, yeah and, and to be honest, Adam, uh, because um, of the NQA, and I got to sort of talk to the majority of the teams around the country, they used to play ball, you know, they used to play the sort of game quite well. You know, they didn't used to sort of um, you know, take uh, the mick out of the CAA and say, oh, we'll just do what we want. They all used to sort of, you know, we never used to overfly people who could help it. Mm. We'd all stick 99.9% .9 of the time to the law. Um, and it was just that sometimes you, you just have to make a snap decision on something. Um, if you get it right, you're a hero. If you don't, it, it's, uh, yeah, they're all over you. I guess it's the same as anything with within the emergency services. You know, I, I'm sure you have to deal with that type of decision all the time. Let alone whether you've got the drone or not. I suppose so. It kind of it, it, it is, Tom. And uh, unfortunately, uh, because of the nature of, of drones and, and the legislation, and Adam will bear me out with this, that there's very few sort of senior police officers and fire officers actually sort of know the legislation behind the drone. <laughs> so what they will have seen is police camera action on the teller. Yes, I'd like to fly a drone two and a half miles to that cliff edge to get the pictures. Uh, and then, you know, I don't care who you've got to fly over, you know, yeah. seven motorways, it doesn't matter. Just just do it and, and get me the pictures. And you haven't got time to explain to them the intricacies no. um, of, of what it can do and what it can't do. Um, it, it, it sort of leads me on to a, a point that you've you just reminded me there, Tommy. Mm. Um, when we first started, we, we, we kept it quite close shop, and I don't know why. You know, we it, it was sort it was our empire. Drones were our empire, and we'll just get on with it. After about four or five years, we saw the benefit of just doing a two-minute video to saying these are our drones. This is what they're flying. This is what we can do. This is some really basic law. Um, so should we come out and we say, yes, we can't fly because it's absolutely teeming down with rain, you sort of understand the rationale now. Uh, um, yeah. and, and, and that had a massive sort of impact on our, on our working. Um, everything mm -hmm. sort of become a lot simpler because everyone sort of got it. Uh, yeah. Whereas at first, it was probably our own fault that we just didn't share enough information with the, with the seniors. Mm, I see. Yeah, yeah. So in terms of, um, I suppose, training, obviously, you know, we have, as you kind of said, the, as far as we're aware, there are no RAEs now that deliver specific blue light training, or at least, you know, as, as it was, you were an NQE that delivered specific bespoke blue light training. Do you think there's, you know, there is a requirement for the emergency services to have specific training that is for the emergency services? To, to be quite honest with you, Adam, so there's two answers to that. One is yes, yes. I, I think they should have their own ground school and uh, a little bit extra tabbed on the end. If I can use the uh, analogy of a driving license, because we do this quite a lot, especially when I listen to you three, um, you get your GVC and you pass your flight test, you've got your driving license. To learn to drive on blue lights, you've got to go on an advanced driving course. Yeah. Yeah. And we were sort of banging the drum with the CEA for many years to say, look, you should have a little add on on the end, uh, specifically for emergency services, because um, without wanting to big it up, because um, I, I don't really want to, it's a highly pressurised flight. Um, if you've got somebody's life on the end of your line and you're flying in the middle of London or in the middle of Manchester in between tower blocks with a, a you know a seven kilo drone, it's not the same as putting a bit mini above a field to, to film a house for an estate agent. The level of pressure 
is is from naught to 100, and you can be at 100 quite a lot. So yeah. to actually pass a pilot out with a CEA GVC flight assessment, yeah, I, I understand there's got to be some kind of bar set where, yeah, you've got to reach a level. Um, but I do think the CEA should perhaps think about, you know, just putting an extra level in for the emergency services. Now, um, God love them. There's a few forces around the country, uh, the Met, Cambridge, Lanks, who have actually sort of put their own training in. So you go and get your GVC. Before you can fly our kit, you've got to do 10 hours and you've got to pass our test. Now, that test, um, I know, is uh, 20, 30 times harder than the, the GVC flight assessment. Mm -hmm. But at the end of it, you come out, if you turn out at 4 o'clock in the morning to that kind of a, you know, a life or death job, you, you, you've experienced it in the training, so you're ready for it. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm not. I'm not doing the CEA a disservice because I was, you know, I've, I've argued about it for years. I just thought they saw it was. Mm, do we really need the hassle to set this up when we've got enough hassle with drones at the moment? It was just like an extra fly in their ointment that they didn't need. Yeah. So yeah, it's. I mean, it's interesting that you say, you know, that there should be a, a course or a qualification for the emergency services. And actually, I would say there's now scope and actually quite easy scope for the CEA to implement an emergency service. Um, bolt on, you know, for the, yeah. you know, the whole pr premise of the, the GVC is to have bolt on courses. And actually, I don't think it's beyond the realms of possibility, which, you know, essentially all they need to do is tell the REs, here's the syllabus, develop a course based on X, Y, and Z. You need to yeah. test them on this. And then, you know, it can be only for the emergency, you know, it's based, you know, as long as it's an emergency service, blue light, whatever, um, mm. they could apply for said bolt on to their operational authorization. It's not out of the realms possible. So it might be something actually we do see fingers crossed in the near future. Obviously it's not here now where I've not spoken to the CA about it, but it's it's the, the it's it, under the new regulations and under the new framework, it is possible now, I think, more yeah. so than the old framework where it was you needed to know. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that we were we were pestering them at the right time, you know, with the sort of yeah. the regs going through and last sort of three or four years has been quite a busy time for the CA. And that was that was pre pandemic. Um, so um, it's it's probably got even worse for them. Um, I don't know. Um, certainly, I, I think you're right, Adam. You know, when it starts to calm down in 12, 18 months, it's, it's something that they could take on. Whether they think it's too small a potato, you know, um, how many you've got uh, about 45 brigades, 40 police forces. So conceivably, you've only got sort of between 50 and 80 drone teams in the UK. Whether they would say, well, you know, you're too small an entity, I'm not sure. Mm. Um, yeah, it might, but... be, it might be something that we, I mean, we as an RE put forward to, as a suggestion, whether we, you know, we deliver it or not. But yeah, it's true. it's something yeah. that we could put forward to the CA to say, look, this is this is what we think they need. It's actually fairly straightforward. We just need a syllabus. We need whatever whatever it is. Is there scope for you to provide um, a whether it's a PDRA or a case two application um, to the CA to say, yeah, this is now your official exemptions based on your operational authorization. There's, there's several facets in emergency service work. Um, I, I mean, I've already mentioned pressure, but thermal imagery is a huge facet, you know, and it is a skill. You've got to be really good at thermal imagery. I could, I could, you know, talk in here for 20 minutes about the benefits of thermal imagery and all the funny stories and, you know, how it works. However, um, at the moment, there's no requirement or there's no test uh, for an emergency service pilot to prove he's any good at sort of, you know, flying in the dark. Um, <laughs> they reckon if you can see a drone at night on the LEDs, well, you must be great. Well, that's just, uh, you know, with the greatest of respect, nonsense. Yeah, um, it's a bit different, isn't it? <laughs> it, it massively, massively. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and, and again, the learning curve is, is pure experience. You know, mm. you, you start off as a new drone pilot and you put a drone up in the middle of the night. Uh, there's so many targets or so many things appear, so many thermal footprints that you can't interpret. So the transformer up a pole in the countryside looks like a person. The hedgehog looks like a person. Horse looks yeah. like a person. Um, I even, um, on a missing person, I, I, I called, um, and we, we might discuss this in a minute, the benefits of actually sort of trying to guide people to a target with a drone. Yeah. Um, but I called sort of three or four policemen onto this target. Um, we were looking for a missing person, and it was I found this body-shaped thermal signature on the ground in the middle of a field, and I thought, bang, you know, uh, fantastic, found it. Just yeah. the right size, and I was quite good at it by this time. This wasn't <laughs> early days 2010. This was like 2019. Yeah. As they surrounded this thermal target, 
they said, yeah, we're here. There's nothing here. And I said, no, he, he's right in front of you. Mm-hmm. Um, and he, he put his foot on the puddle and I could see the ripples and it was a human-shaped uh, puddle. Oh, now, water uh, retains its heat, especially after dusk. So it looks oh. like if you've got a human-shaped puddle, it's a human lying <laughs> with his arms and legs wow. out. Now, the police yeah. think we do it on purpose, you know, just so they have to walk <laughs> yeah. across a muddy field. But it's, <laughs> it's, I know, and I know it's a bit flippant, but it's it's the kind of thing, you know, thermal yeah. imagery. Um, it's definitely life or death stuff, that kind of, you know, h- yeah. how good you actually are. Yeah. Um, we, we've had instances where uh, I found a young 19-year-old girl next to a, uh, a train line who was threatening to kill herself. She was just waiting for the next train to come along. And we were searching the bushes. Now, you'll know yourselves... Thermal imagery can't penetrate a tree canopy. However, mm-hmm. if you're any good at it, you can occasionally find a little speck of temperature or white or black or whatever you're looking for. Yeah. Um, and we did. We found this girl. We stopped to throw her in front of a train. Absolutely mm. brilliant job. Yeah. But when we reviewed the footage, which we do or we used to do on all our jobs, the um, nine out of the ten pilots didn't even spot it. And I still think it's there's an element of luck with it. You know, yeah. was, was that something or wasn't it? It's dead easy to discount it. Um, yeah. I know there'll be people who are listening to this say, oh, you're just bigging this up. We're not. <laughs> you know, since I've been flying commercially, my, my life is just so easy. You know, <laughs> if I don't get the right pitch, I'll just go back the, the next day yeah. and do it again. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it's a, nice, if I can't... a nice change of pace, I should imagine, <laughs> slightly. <laughs> well, yeah, if, if I can't fly from that particular field, I'll go and find somewhere else. I don't yeah. have to go off a rooftop with about three foot space either side of it. <laughs> Or you know mm. that kind of stuff. It's 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 yeah. yeah. I, I'm going on anyway. Yeah. No, no, it's all very interesting. I, I think it's quite good to hear sort of the behind the scenes and uh, bits and pieces like that. It's all interesting from our point of view, and hopefully the listeners as well. But uh, Adam, there's a few more bits and pieces I think to sort of carry on with potentially. Yeah, um, I think an interesting one is sort of other drone users. Um, you know, no, obviously don't um, get when you're started, out started, Adam. <laughs> well, we are. We're about to. We're about to. Um, we're about to open this can of worms. So obviously, you know, you've especially. I mean, under the new regulations now, I would say well, suddenly we've just opened up the UK and I suppose the rest of Europe, but we're focused on the UK to sub two hundred and fifty grand drones. Yeah, you, know, you can fly them now with no required training. Um, all they got to do is read the user manual. Obviously, when you were doing it, it, you know, it was the PFCO, and you just had people that were flying the drones because they either a were ignorant didn't know the regulations or b they just didn't care um so obviously now you've got all these mavic minis all these people that know it all (laughs) um how did you or how do the emergency services deal with these people you know on the ground where you know it's a high pressured environment and you've got these guys rocking up with their own aircraft or so just disregarding Historically, Adam, we dealt with it really badly um, <laughs> in, in, in as much as um, if you've got your drone in the air and it, it's performing a task, it, it's, it's either monitoring an individual that's containing an area for the cops or you're looking for somebody and if you don't find them in the next 20 minutes, there's a good chance you know they're, they're going to expire. Um, and then you have somebody turning up either from a local paper or, as you say, the local sort of uh, Mavic Mini owner who thinks, oh, this will look like, you know, a great pitch on the front of the Telegraph tomorrow. So I'll just whiz my drone around at a million miles an hour. Um, So it was the bane of our lives. And initially, sort of back in 2014, if you can get hold of one, you just jump all over it. That is not the way to sort of deal with people. Um, We we were sort of really quick to realise that if we didn't take a draconian stance and we could actually locate them and explain to them what was going on, um, they were far more, you know... uh, reasonable with with us and they, and they wouldn't fly the drone um Fine. so yeah. that that was sort of a big step we took forward however you will always get people who who will not want to break the law but want to sort of just um fly around the fringes of aviation industry law shall we say um now what they don't realize is if they put their drone up at one of our incidents police or fire we have to land if we have to land, it's not performing the task. And, and conceivably, you could sort of uh, cause a death. Uh, on a lot of fire incidents, I mean, I'm not going to go into the intricacies, but we are looking for sort of special things. We're looking for building collapse signs. We're looking for cylinders. We're looking for all sorts of stuff that can go wrong, which mm. is why we have to leave a drone up in the air for two or three hours. You know, obviously, we'll swap them out with batteries. But yeah, yeah, um, yeah. if we have to land it for 20, 30, 40 minutes while we go and look for somebody who's flying it from a local estate, um, because we can't have our drone. You can't have a £50,000 drone in the air at the same time as somebody whizzing around with a Mavic, because obviously, uh, you know, 
if it brings us down, that's it's it's bad news. Yeah. Um, so we we ran lots of social media campaigns uh, and we were quite successful trying to explain to people if there's a job, please don't fly your drone. You know, the best way for drone operators to sort of get some of that um, you know real life incident type footage is to actually connect with us with a media department and say, look, I won't fly my drone, but for my local paper, can we have some of your drone footage? Um, okay. And it's it, that's much more sort of palatable to the fire service and the police than people flying their own drones. Mm. Um, it's um, the uh, Cap 722 came, uh, uh, the new Cap 722 that came out last year, they put a section in, I think it's 4.2.2.3, um, but... Adam will be the person who'll know that. He's, yeah. he's nodding. He's nodding. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I'll look, I can look it up, but that was, uh, that was well remembered. No, no, we've, we've pretty much had no legislation in the old CAP 722, but this basically says um, that if you are flying a drone, please do not fly close or inside the area where an emergency response is, got, is ongoing, unless you have permission ah, okay. to do so. Now, I've had people contact me and said, well, I'm going to fly 150 metres away, so I should be fine. That's different legislation. You know, he's just mm. picking that figure out and using it for the emergency service one. What he doesn't understand is um, you might have an epicentre of an incident that's, I don't know, one or 200 metres wide, but our uh, radius of operation might be up to half a mile or a mile because we need to see what's going on in the periphery with, for all sorts of reasons, traffic control, uh, fire spread, missing persons. We could, we could go out at least 1,000 metres. So yeah. we, you can't, even 150 metres, we don't want people flying around it. Now, I, I know general public and there'll be some, uh, you know, and I've, had, I've been called out on social media before by people saying, oh, we'll fly our drones where we want to, you know, we, you can't stop us flying. Yeah. To be honest with you, conceivably, there's so few policemen nowadays, you can't stop you. You know, I have not got time to be running around a, a housing estate looking for somebody flying a drone out the back garden. It yeah. would take several hours to probably locate them. Um, so we, we, we found if we could do some kind of a social media launch, you know, on all the different sort of uh, mediums, whatever they're called nowadays, um, mm. we could actually sort of appeal to people. Now, we did see a downturn um, in, in operation, um, but that will not last. You will always get somebody who wants to get that magic picture that the fire service or the police or what they're doing there. Um, and it's because... The industry is a victim of its own success. Drones are that cheap and that easy to fly, and the cameras are that good now. Um, yeah. it, 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 it's almost impossible to stop, Adam. Yeah. So yeah, does does that, answer wanna... you, does that answer your question? Yeah, definitely. It was, to be honest, it was quite interesting that you did bring up the fact that you know that uh, the emergency services can, as you said, for the you know, missing persons can fly out to a thousand meters. Um, and I think there's something regarding the uh, in the. Um, the exemption as well. I believe they can potentially go up to two thousand meters. So, so um, you can, you in, can in actually go. You can actually go past two k. Now we used to have a really good drone that went up to ten k, but I never flew it past about eighteen hundred meters because really, um, whatever drone you're using, even if it, you can get the full forty minutes out of the battery, by the time you've flown that far, done your task and get it back, you are actually sort of not looking at a long time over task if you're flying yeah. that far out. Yeah. Um, so it's highly unusual, but it was, it was I would say, really usual to fly between 500 and 1,000 metres. That was more the, you know, the operating distance. Mm. Um, and I know sometimes you, you may say, Adam, well, instead of doing that, why can't you just move your, your, your taller or your take off a landing point, as you call it? Um, it's, it's too much time. You know, by the time mm. you put your kit in the car and drove half a mile and then got the kit out again, the yeah. person you were actually sort of looking will have, will have gone. Yeah. Um, a couple of points here, and I, I, I don't know if this is the right time to bring it up, but um, when you're actually sort of flying the drone on a task and you've got eyes on a target, whether it be a missing person or somebody on a roof or somebody on a, a tall building, um, you do need to keep eyes on. So um, I know there was um, a lady who did the traffic surveys a couple of weeks ago. She was talking yeah. about relaying drones. We call it hot swapping, where we'd mm. put one drone up and bring another down so we could keep eyes on. But you need two drones and you need two drone operators and you both need to know what you're doing. So it's quite a difficult thing to do. Um, as something as easy, or you may think it's easy, is if you've got a dog handler who's chasing a subject through a set of woods and you've got a drone, you've got to keep your eye on the subject, you've got to keep your eye on the dog handler, and then you've got to keep your eye on the drone. Yeah. And, and you're moving sort of three or four things at once. And it's incredibly difficult on a, on a limited battery. 
mm, you know okay, so I'm, i imagine you must get like the fatigue levels at the end of it you must just want to collapse by the time well, you put, it, put, put yeah. the drone back down well, and just you, want to be like you know oh, that down. 20 minutes equals two hours flying that they do uh it, it's that doesn't it's not the same for commercial two hours flying commercial is two hours for me 20 minutes is two hours when you're doing emergency and it's it's just that you used to put the drone back on the ground and your heart was still doing 180 uh mm. you know and sweating and this was after sort of several hundred flights um, because it was such a, a, a pressurised, difficult job, and it is, which harks back to the training. You know, if you're... Uh, I used to sort of argue with um, chief police... Uh, sorry, police constables, uh, police chiefs, fire chiefs, that there's no point in uh, buying 30 Mavics and giving it to 90 cops, you know, to put in the back of the police car, because the skill fade is, is massive and it's too yeah. diluted. You'd be better buying two drones and giving it four people. You might only get 70% of the jobs, but you'll fly them 70% of the jobs really well. Whereas, yes, you might actually sort of make a stab at m reaching most incidents, but you're going to fly them poorly because the people who are flying them are just not getting the experience or the kit's not up to it. Yeah. So that's, that's an interesting one, just sort of touch on that is, do all the emergency services, all the different emergency services have their own drone teams or is it a bit of a mixed bag where some have their own dedicated you know, drone pilots and others are just, as you've said, you know, so, stick a Mavic in everyone's boots. Uh, there are there are uh, pure fire teams, there's pure police teams, and there's joint police and fire teams. Um, at the inception, back in 2010, and, and Manchester were just the same as everyone else, it was look at what's the cheapest option. Now, to get a, a teenager who can fly these things, you know, fantastically uh, would cost no money. However, getting into a job in the middle of the night under blue lights is incredibly difficult. Plus, the things I've talked to you about before, the actual things you've got to be looking at at an incident, you can only do with a firefighter or a police officer. You know, you might have the world's best pilot, you know, one of you three, uh, Matthew, for instance. If he doesn't mm. know what he's looking at at a job, it doesn't matter how good a pilot is because he's going to miss all the stuff. So it, it was quite obvious early doors that he's got to be a you know a firefighter or a police officer. Yeah. Um, the, the crewing model um, is the biggest bugbear. It was always, uh, how much can we afford? How many pilots can we afford? How do we keep this going 24-7? Um, you know, and, and the, some forces, I think West Yorkshire trained about 50 pilots up with 30 Mavics, told them it's not going to work. And, and it doesn't because you're diluting stuff. Met Police, you know, massive organisation. Started off with six pilots and three Sky Rangers absolutely did it so right, you know, so professional, because all the jobs they turned up to, the, all their pilots were really experienced. Um, so finances come into it, Adam. You know, how much money have we got to spend? Because if you're taking four cops off the streets to fly a drone, they've got to be actually producing something nowadays, haven't they? Um, yeah. it's, it's all about sort of, you know, people talk about on the beat. However, there is a rationale sometimes, Going forward, you know, if everyone's got a drone in the pocket, put a Mavic Mini in your pocket and we just toss it in the air. Um, yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's a difficult one. And, and, and that crewing model, most fire services and police services across the UK have always struggled with. And there's only a few got it absolutely bang on. Yeah, so it sounds like, from your experience anyway, it's more keep a condensed team that's highly skilled, that's always on it, yeah. Rather, yeah. Than, rather than scattergun and be like, oh, the you know these these ten haven't flown in months, and by the time they actually get to the job, they've forgot everything. It's better to have a team that's week in week out dedicated to one one thousand percent, Adam, one thousand yeah. percent, and the t and the the best teams around the country, i.e. the Met um, and Cambridge Place people like that, absolutely superb because they fly all the time. So when I used to. I used to sort of go and help them on incidents, not because, you know, they just wanted me down for a bit of a laugh. Uh, I, I used to sort of do their peer reviews because you peer review each other's flying and, you know, whether you're doing it properly. Mm. Um, and it was a pleasure to go out with some teams. And I used to think, wow, you are so professional. I'm going to steal all your ideas and take them back to Langston, and Manchester. Uh, and it, I, I'm not going to name names, but there's some poor ones out there as well. I suppose it's just like commercial operators, you know, yeah. people who don't maintain the kit, they don't train properly, and then they expect to turn out on a high-profile job and deliver. Um, yeah. and, and generally, they don't. No. That's it. it reminds me of flight tests, and obviously you can probably relate to this as well. You know, when you've done probably 1,500, 2,000 flight tests, you know the people who are good and they've done it before or they've you know put a lot of effort into it, and then there's people that haven't. And there's quite a big difference between the people who haven't 
done much or haven't bothered and people who have really put the effort in and yeah. really practiced as well. Yeah. I, I think um, one of the biggest benefits of, of flying commercially and doing flight assessments is you're able to talk to people and actually say, do you know when you go out, your, your risk assessment and your pre-site survey does mean something, you know. So yeah. please don't think this is just your assessment test thing because it's something you've, you you will benefit you. And if you yeah. sort of explain to them that going forward, this has happened to me and, you know, give them some anecdotal evidence. Yeah, exactly. I think it actually sort of wakes uh, one or two people up. But mm. you're quite right. Um, you pretty much know the person who's just going to sort of uh, never look at a pre-site survey as soon as it walks off your field. Um, <laughs> but but what what can you do? Yeah. Um, exactly. You can only try, can't you? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. No, I think that's been very interesting. I think those uh, subjects that we've just covered have been, uh, yeah, sort of a, a bit of an eye-opener, I think, for a for a lot of us as well, which is good. So I think we're just going to finish off with a few more questions and uh, we're going to uh, ask uh, Matthew if he's got anything to add to uh, what we've been talking about. So, uh, yeah, Matthew. Oh, we can't Are hear you, Matthew. Yeah. Have to unmute yourself, Matthew. <laughs> oh, is that better? Sorry about there that. There we go. That doesn't happen. Oh, yeah. Let's try again. Let's try again. <laughs> Skilled by error, mate, honestly. Well, I, I must tell you that uh, the, the moment of mute was better than the neighbour mowing the lawn just now, so um, apologies for that. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> um, Christy, I started to say uh, when I was muted um, that you and I spent a bit of time in the field learning together, and it was very interesting getting your feel and sort of uh, comparing experience and so on. I'm interested in what you see as the future for uh, emergency services, what you'd like to see perhaps in the future in terms of equipment and the way that the equipment's used and so on. What would you like to see change and what would you like to see uh, develop in terms of technology and the way that the technology is used? So uh, I'm 99% I'm confident that this is going to happen, Matt. So brilliant question. Um, so <laughs> you've, you've got companies at the moment like CZI and, and a few others who are doing some fantastic work with remote flying of drones or, you know, pretty much putting a drone in, a, in an autonomous box and leaving it to itself. So we're not far off the uh, capability at the moment of, you know, say a small town, Nottingham, something like that. You have nine or ten drones who are, who are dotted around on high buildings and cover the city. Mm -hmm. If a car comes in with a police control, yeah, you've got an algorithm on the control operator who picks an address up and warms that drone up. As soon as they actually say, yeah, we have got a robbery in uh, progress or we've got a missing person or something like that, um, that drone will actually sort of self-launch, yeah? It will make its way to the job and it will actually be hovering in the sky, beaming pictures back to the control as people arrive. Now, you've, if, if, you, if you threw a million pound at that, you could probably do that next week. I don't think that's too far away, Matt. I really don't, you know, mm. within two years. I still definitely think there's a necessity to have um, what we've got now, you know, a drone that you could put anywhere, just mm -hmm. in case some drones don't reach it. But I think that autonomous sort of overview mm. uh, yeah. is, is very, very close. Yeah, so AI technology, as we've seen introduced in recent time by some of the manufacturers, perhaps that is the way forward. Um, the other thing I'm interested about is, of course, a lot of the data that you're capturing is probably sort of quite confidential and so on. How are you guys moving the data around securely and so on? Is that all done internally? Or are we using different systems to what uh, sort of mainline users are used to? So initially, it was um, we had no way of doing it, and people were moving imagery around on Skype, um, Skype for business, and all sorts of stuff. You know, insecure sites. Um, mm. As it's moved forward, most people now, uh, especially since GDPR and Data Protection Act, realise you've got to put in some kind of a, an auditable sort of secure system for moving your data around. Mm -hmm. Now. Um, when I first started, it was basically you went up, you took your pictures, you landed the drone, you took the SD card out, put it in the back yep. of a computer and ran around and found the officer in charge and say, would you like <laughs> to see me drone pictures like some, you know, some puppet? Um, <laughs> if he, he, a, a nine times out of ten, he, he was so uh, nervous about looking at pictures he hadn't seen before, he would shy away from it. No, you know, because if I showed him the pictures, invariably, they'd have to do something because there'd be something in that imagery <laughs> that needed yep. doing. Yep. However... We've gone sort of leaps and bounds now. You've got uh, firms like Accelerate and Airbox, and you just basically plug a base station in or plug it into your controller, and it will now sort of move it with a, a high degree of security um, to all sorts of police controls and fire controls. Um, mm. I was, uh, I can't say the operation, but I was flying a job with a Met, and we were flying in Hyde Park. So it's funny you should be talking about the uh, the zones last week, Adam, and, you know, what you can and you can't fly in. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 
And we had two drones on the ground uh, that were beaming directly to Scotland Yard. So high profile oh, nice. job, you know, this can't go wrong. They were on the deck, warmed up, ready to go. So as soon as something happened, we could we could launch them. Um, yeah. We put the first drone up, and uh, because it had been on the ground for about 20 minutes, it must have had about 300 ants running all over it. Yeah, <laughs> And all all they got in New Scotland Yard was a load of ants running across the camera lens, no way. <laughs> which, which, which we thought was hilarious, yeah, but they didn't, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So imagine, yeah. It's, it's, it's amazing that, you know, you, you, you get that sort and then something else happens, and you get that and something else sort, and, and yeah. Uh, but basically, to answer your question, it's done really securely now, Matthew. Um, you know, nobody can break into it, and it's, it's, it's really efficient. I've just got a quick kind of follow-up on that one. Um, I don't know if it's something you'll be able to answer or not. It's just more actually towards uh, kind of the DJI thing. So obviously, you know, from a military point of view, a lot of the military sites won't use DJI because of, you know, obvious reasons with, you know, the issues with China and whatnot. But is that is that issue applicable to the emergency services? I mean, I'm thinking more kind of police more so than perhaps the fire service. Has that been discussed, do you know, or is it's, that a bit of a non-issue at the moment? So, so it's definitely been discussed. I, I'd have to be careful um, saying something about DJI um, on, on a podcast, uh, <laughs> but it's definitely been discussed in the past, you know, uh, can we use a DJI? Because uh, there was always this urban myth that they had some bug in that sent all our footage back to China. I think you'll find that, 90% of police and firework, even 95%, would it really matter if people were looking at our pictures? You know, if we were doing a missing person, if we were doing a containment, if we were filming uh, a football ground, you know, public order, a big fire, most of the stuff it is not necessary. However, your counter-terrorism stuff, your CT stuff, um, then you would have to be sort of majorly careful what you're using. Now, D I'm not going to get into, uh, you know, do I think DJI are secure or would I use them? I think they're an extremely capable drone. You know, they might bring a model out and it's fantastic. The next model uh, might not be so good and then they'll bring another one out that improves mm. it. So as a police force and you've got a, a finite budget, you might be forced to use DJI because it's the only thing you can use that's any good. However, you'd have to trade off on the security thing if you've got, you know, if you think there's any sort of, uh, anything sort of going on behind the scenes, really. I mean, I've got to be majorly careful, and I'm not accusing anyone of anything, but, but them conversations have happened for the past four, four to five years, Adam. Does that answer your question? Sort yeah, of, abs absolutely. With, yeah, with, absolutely. Just, just an interesting one, whether it was kind of, whether it was being, obviously from the counter-terrorism point, it does make complete sense. Yeah. But yeah, just, it's just interesting, really, just um, see whether the, the conversations had been had. Yeah. It's it, it, to be quite truthful. When we first started, it wasn't people pinching the pictures and doing something with them. It was other users taking control of your drone that we were worried about. You know, having a secure uh, connection between your drone. That was the biggest, especially in town centres, because yeah. there's that many sort of frequencies knocking around in central London and central Manchester that you would not want to lose a drone over Oxford Road through a, you know somebody trying to take control. So yeah, we had to be extremely careful with uh, that kind of stuff and frequencies. Oh, I see. Yeah. I, again, following on from that side of things, I wonder, for, from my point of view, I'd have almost thought that that almost wasn't possible because of the sort of the handshake with the transmitter and the aircraft. You know, it's not looking for another control signal, but it sounds like it, it, it could be possible. So, you have so, much so, so that? I would, Tom, um, but when you think there is quite a, um, how can I put this? Uh, so there's quite a big counter-terrorism drone movement in the UK at the moment. Ah, yeah. Okay. And and I know the sort of uh, utopian vision is, you know, rather than zapping some with some sort of space laser and it just drops out of the sky, yeah. if you can point some out here and actually take control of that drone, mm. that's that's going to be the, uh, you know, that's what you want to do. And I know, I you know, they're not too far away from that sort of kind of technology uh. as we speak. So if the good guys have got it, invariably the, <laughs> the bad guys have had it for about three years. So. <laughs> I see. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, no, no. I, I, I did also assume that there will probably would be something that someone's knocked up in their in their shed or something that could probably do what we've been talking about. So no, it is interesting, isn't it? But uh, uh, but no, that's good. I think we've actually got to the end of our kind of listed questions, I guess. Really. So um, has anyone got anything else they want to sort of add or anything people want to go over or anything Chris wants to say or otherwise? It's been very good. I think really interesting episode. Well, I've just got one sort of. Um, a question and it's just regarding kind of the search and rescue more than because you know you, you see on facebook there's a lot of volunteers doing search and rescue and oh, yeah. want to do search searching and rescue for and, lost dogs and things yeah and searching <laughs> for lost dogs big thing on obviously on the facebook yeah. group and whatnot and um 
obviously, you know, this they aren't emergency service. They're not blue light. What's your kind of advice for those guys that, you know, think, oh, because I'm doing this, well, maybe I can take advantage of the uh, these exemptions because it's an emergency. Um, you know, what, what's your advice to these guys that are or want to do these search and rescues for, you know, lost dogs, missing persons that have just decided to take it up upon themselves to, to go and, well, in, in the best intentions, help. Find Daisy. So, yeah, exactly. So a uh, huge <laughs> minefield at the moment, Adam. Um, when I was still sort of working for the fire service and the police, uh, it wasn't the general public, it was uh, Mountain Rescue, um, who, who, you know, fantastic organisation. And if you can sort of uh, work properly with them, they're, they're a huge asset to any force. But you would get occasional people who would turn up with a, a DJI Phantom. Yeah, this is my drone. Is it OK if I search over this ridge with my drone? And mm -hmm. if you've got somebody's family and little Johnny's been missing for three days... It's extremely difficult to say, no, we prefer it if you kept your drone in your box and, and we'll do all the searching, you know, because the family just going to look at you and say, well, you know, perhaps you should be using everything you possibly can do. What I would say is, again, you've got to sort of uh, start working with these people, not particularly the general public, but certainly something like the Mountain Rescue. Um, and it's from a training perspective. So if you put a drone up and say, oh, somebody turns up, yeah, I want to go out and search this field, and then come back and say, well, I've searched the field. Well, what's he done? What search pattern has he done? Do we have to go and research that field after you've searched it? You know, have you got a thermal camera because it's at night? What experience mm. have you got? What radio channel have you got if you find something? <laughs> what's your experience in guiding people on? And before you know it, it's, it's actually sort of more hassle than it's worth having people sort of with their own drones. Um, please don't let me sort of, uh, you know, think I'm, I'm dizzing people because I'm not. And I think if Mountain Rescue could actually sort of get their act together, um, they they would be a fantastic asset. But the, they sh they're the type of people who should be flying drones on missing persons. I'm not sure that the general public with, uh, you know, uh, limited skills, shall we say. I know when we get a missing people and you get, say, 300 people turning up at a local estate because they know mm. the person who's missing, and it's almost impossible to sort of corral them. It's like uh, herding butterflies. You just can't do it. And if they're trampling over evidence and, you know, the, the proper Palsa police search advisor, he, he, he just wants some sort of, sort of protocol behind his search. It's really difficult to, uh, to ensure that. And it's exactly the same for, for flying a drone. You know, if you let somebody up with a mini, then somebody turns up with an M600 and starts flying it over 300 people. Um, the mayhem, wouldn't it? Yeah, exactly. It, it would, but do you know, I, um, we were flying a missing person a while ago. It's about four or five years ago. Certainly, somebody turned up with a, um, a fixed wing. Yeah, massive glider thing. <laughs> uh, and we pretty much said, yeah, whatever. Uh, you know, you go and search that beach four miles away with your polystyrene winged, uh, you know, <laughs> thing. Yeah. Uh, he came back and he'd probably done one of the most thorough searches I'd ever seen, ever. You know, and he had all the, and he was obviously a professional. He had yeah. all his imagery there, and he had all his grid lines and everything. Oh, so nice. yeah. even though I've, I've sort of probably spoke quite badly to the public, you can get surprised now and again. But, but mm. how, as I say, how do you hurt him? How do you get him, make him accountable? Because yeah. if, if he's your, uh, your head's on the block for, yeah, I have searched that field, and then they turn up in that field three days later, yeah, you're not going to better find yeah. a member of the public with a with a phantom <laughs> who, who, whose words you took, are you? So <laughs> yeah, no. I, suppose, I suppose because you're the ones that are organising, you're the ones that are accountable, not the the member of the public that's decided to or been approved to go and fly in the field. It'll come back to you as the yeah, well, yeah, as, as the people accountable for doing the search operations. It, it, yeah, and uh, uh, missing persons was was our bread and butter. We got more missing persons um, incidents than any any other type. Uh, so we got really sort of good at them. But it's it's what the good at. I mean, you know, yes, you can do large open areas. Yeah, you can do I don't riverbanks, uh, quarries over the top of cliffs. But there's some areas that you you, you don't need a drone, um, mm. and you'd be better using a dog or an underwater search team. So um, yeah, uh, public are great, but you've got to be able to control them. <laughs> so what's your sort of advice then for you know for for the public you know as as a, an ex emergency service um person uh, you know what's your advice to the public you know if they do want to help with their drones 
obviously, yep. or for whatever reason, or even if they want to, you know, as you said, as we mentioned earlier about flying the drones to take a photo of the station, what's what's the correct process? What should what should they do? So they should contact the local police force and the local fire service and say, you know, I'm Bob Smith. I've got this drone. If I, if you get any incidents, can I fly it on it? If I can't fly it immediately, would it be better fly it the day after and get some press pictures? And if you get um, in connection with the media or the corporate comms department, they will tell you exactly what you can do with your drone. And then it's not you're just not batting people off for the sake of it. You know, you're actually engaging with them and, and hopefully sort of keeping them sweet. Um, as we've discussed, you're going to get 1% of people who will do no, none of that, Adam. Yeah. <laughs> and will still sort of insist on flying the drone with the LEDs turned out at, you know, three in the morning or two foot above your head. There's yeah. nothing you can do about that, and I don't, I don't think it's a, a quick fix, that. But for nice people, yeah, who want to help, yeah, just engage with your local fire service, your local drone team, and your local police uh, service, and just see if you can actually sort of help. There might be some benign task that they can actually perform, because not only do we do sort of, you know, dynamic operational incidents, we used to do a lot of pre-filming. So if you had a job, we'd take a picture of a particular area, I don't know, like a pop festival. So mm. all the surrounding countryside and as they were setting it up. Now, that might be the kind of job where you could use the public and say, well, actually, yeah, fantastic. Would you take them four fields and bring us some stills back, please? Um, as long as they're operating, you know, within their uh, legislation. Um, mm. And that sort of might be a trade-off from wanting to fly at live incidents. Yeah, that's good advice, isn't it? I think, and that's uh, a nice, uh, a nice place to finish as well. I think too. So, um, yeah, thank you very much, Chris, for coming on. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, yeah, it's, it's brilliant. I, I, I can't believe an hour has gone. So if anyone's <laughs> listening to this, uh, they'll have probably fallen asleep about fifty-two minutes ago. I would have thought, won't they? Oh. We find that it's very easy to talk for a long time, isn't it? But I usually wait till Matt does his weather. But um, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we haven't got time for that in this episode. Oh, <laughs> right. you know. No, but I think uh, on behalf of all of us, I think it's been very interesting. Uh, lots of good topics covered, and uh, a bit of advice mm. for other drone users uh, as well, really. So uh, again, thanks for much chris and uh, we'll speak to you soon thanks adam thanks matthew and uh, yeah we'll see you all uh, again next week cheers boys